Hello traders, it's Friday, October the 7th. This is John Kickletter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give your FX market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, as well as an hour for what we can expect in the final 24 hours of trading ahead of us. Well, for most of the markets, it was a relatively quiet session, and we were more or less just retrenching before we got to the key event risk for the week, which many believe is going to be the non-farm payrolls that we have on Friday. Uh, this is definitely going to be noteworthy event risk, and it's going to carry its considerable influences. We know that even if it is not a uh, economic shift, it is certainly uh, capable of generating vol volatility through its media presence. And in the lead-up to major event risk like non-farm payrolls or other uh, indicators or events that have similar uh, influence or sway, uh, we often see the markets quiet because not many people are willing to take major trades before the release of such uh, influential event risk because they don't want to be caught on the wrong side. Reasonable assumption. However, things didn't end up being as quiet as we would expect. Yes, we would have the S&P 500. Uh, this is actually the Spider ETF, which I consistently look at. And volume, as you can see, was considerably lower. This was working its way in a consolidation a range. And I even asked uh, traders what they thought was going to happen going forward, whether we would be able to find a break, perhaps uh, through the end of this week, and uh, have it uh, arrive from the non-farm payrolls, or be motivated by non-farm payrolls. 69% of the people that responded to my poll uh, said yes, there would be a break uh, from the S&P 500, as well as the DXY. Now, at the very least, those that voted for a break uh, uh, were partially right on the DXY. We had a clear move here above the top end of this uh, descending trend line. The motivation for this move, however, was not uh, coming from a slow, steady build of expectation or anticipation to non from payrolls. Rather, it was the doing of one particular currency pair, and that was the pound dollar. The pound dollar was hammered early trading in Tokyo, and that was a motivation of uh, news. Uh, coming across the wires were remarks from French President Hollande, Francois Hollande, who suggested in a, in a dinner, uh, a speech, that the EU should approach the uh, Brexit negotiations with a hard-line approach. They, in essence, or uh, that's what his, he's encouraging, uh, they should take a, a position that would deliver some pain to the United Kingdom. Now, we've talked about this before. This is almost certainly going to be the approach that the European Union takes. However, the question becomes, how vocal are they going to be about these intentions in the lead-up to the actual negotiations? And I think that uh, from Theresa May, the UK Prime Minister's position, she has been increasing her rhetoric. All right, the tumble that we see in uh, the cable, the pound dollar that started off the week, was actually motivated by Theresa May, who suggested that uh, they would potentially uh, forego access to the single market, the European Union's uh, favorable trade structure, uh, to secure what she deems as the most uh, poignant or uh, motivating factor in the Brexit vote, the Leave vote, which was to uh, control immigration. And many European Union uh, leaders have said that the UK cannot have the benefits without the obligations. All right, and from Theresa May's perspective, it seemed like the UK was going to, to approach with a pretty aggressive uh, negotiation. But hearing one of the core members, uh, France is a core member of the European Union and the European Monetary Union. That's very important to remember here. Uh, it is. A necessity to hear from them that they are going to ensure that it is not encouraged for other union members to follow the UK out of whether the EU or the Eurozone. Because if, if so, if the UK gets the best of both worlds, no longer having to uh, pay uh, the obligations or pay the tariffs or pay uh, through uh, loose immigration uh, for access to the single market, then what would stop 
others from following suit. It would look like a very appealing situation, and they would indeed follow. Uh, there are countries that are still suffering recession. Unemployment rates of the entire population, 25% the youth unemployment rate, uh, half the country or half the youth population. That is, these are countries that are in very dire straits and they could uh, use the same kind of uh, favorable circumstances. This is especially true from those within the European Monetary Union, the EMU, which is also the 19 countries that share the euro. They have it uh, the worst, if you want to look at it that way. They have the greatest obligations in that they have to uh, have their monetary policy dictated by a single entity, the ECB, and it is obviously direly uh, or extremely uh, different for one versus the other, how this policy impacts their country. Germany, for example, who has been doing very well uh, over the past uh, four or five years, versus, let's say, Greece, who has dipped in and out of recession throughout that same period. Now, if you leave the European Monetary Union and no longer have to have your uh, benchmark rates dictated by the ECB, you can uh, decide to drop interest rates even further, even faster. You can pursue even greater quantitative easing programs. You could proactively devalue your, your, do devalue your own currency. You could also decide to default on your debt, which they cannot do within the European Union or the European Monetary Union. So it is a very appealing thing if the UK were to exit without problems. And in essence, Aland uh, was giving voice to what we had already known, but to hear it certainly unnerved the markets. Uh, and you have to consider the circumstances with which it comes. Uh, we've already had Theresa May uh, and a number of surveys come across wires suggesting that the Brexit uh, was going to be an aggressive push and the thin markets would certainly also add uh, to this very rapid decline. This was such a dramatic decline, in fact, that we actually saw uh, a uh, 600 pip drop in the span of two minutes. This is a minute chart. Two minutes and we dropped 600 pips. Since then, we've uh, recovered a considerable amount of that lost ground. However, the sterling is now going to remain on guard. Traders are going to be very, very skeptical about what the uh, proclivities, the behavior of the market is going to be. Um, now, this is definitely a pound-directed pain. Uh, we had the uh, pound-dollar, the euro-pound rally to the upside, the pound-kiwi, which I've been watching very closely. All right, there goes that record low. Uh, the pound-Aussie, the pound-yen. All right, all of these crosses have suffered from this dramatic move. And the sterling is going to remain on the back foot. Many traders are going to be questioning its next move, and now it's going to be seen more permanently fixed as being in a uh, bearish vortex. Uh, so my intention to trade a rebound from the sterling, which I still hold on a fundamental basis, but clearly I cannot uh, expect to trade this in a reasonable way in the immediate future. All right, that'd be trying to pick bottoms in uh, the end of uh, momentum, which I do not want to do. It is statistically improbable, and thereby it's probably going to be a big hit to my account, and I don't want to suffer that. So the sterling, uh, we should definitely keep an eye on. However, if you're trying to trade it uh, to the downside, remember that there isn't really good precedence uh, for continuation because when you look at a big picture, this is a monthly chart, you do have lower lows back in 1985, but it is not going to be particularly easy to motivate it down. If you get if you give the right uh, drivers, like uh, let's say uh, German Chancellor Merkel decides the uh, tomorrow that she wants to join the fray and say that the UK must suffer for its Brexit decision, then yeah, we might have another push lower. But that is dependent upon uh, unexpected and thereby uh, improbable news, and I don't want to get involved in that. All right, so the pound it needs to remain on our radar. But another currency that I think is very important here is the euro. Now, Halan was talking about 
a need to essentially punish the UK for its uh, its EU referendum. Right? Not beca necessarily because it's uh, deciding to leave, but because they want to dissuade others from following suit and thereby creating a systemic risk or uh, an existential risk, meaning the dissolution of these unions, uh, and they want to do that at all costs. So the question now becomes, on one hand, the pound is going to suffer, and we already have priced in a considerable amount of that suffering, but to a certain degree, the euro is going to suffer as well. All right, it might not be nearly as much as the pound, or it could be significantly more. If they don't efficiently uh, imply upon the UK uh, the negative fallout of its, uh, of its uh, decision to leave, then the threat of other countries following suit will rise and the euro's stability will be called into question. Its number two reserve status will be diminished significantly and uh, investors, long-term investors will uh, doubt that the relationships amongst the EU countries can remain in their cor current format. All right, that would be enormous. That would be a huge systemic change for the entire global financial system. Uh, and it's a little bit too early to call that as a imminent risk. But when you look at something, let's say, like the euro pound, this is, some, this is a currency pair that definitely gives the assessment of who stands to lose the most or who currently is seen as losing the most. A very important exchange rate uh, for the containment or the spread and contagion of a EU breakup. All right. Is it just going to be the divorce of one country from the Union or uh, many participants within the Union? Now as we debate which uh, currency is in a better position, Euro or Pound, or which is in a worse position, there is a uniform improvement and appeal uh, to the world's most liquid currency. Because what we're talking about here is questions of uh, appeal for the the uh, two of the world's most liquid currencies, all right, and that is the euro, which accounts for uh, oops, which accounts for nearly 19 percent of all reserve holdings, all right, and the pound, which is the green line here, as of 2015's numbers, it was the third most liquid reserve. Now, you could always go to something like the yen or the CAD or the Aussie, but those are significantly smaller. All right, they're, they don't really conform or they're not really capable of absorbing that kind of liquidity. So where is capital going to go if it's fleeing the euro and the pound uh, because of the Brexit standoff? It's going to go to the world's most liquid currency, the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar stands to benefit uh, regardless of who is in a worse position amongst the euro and the pound. And this is why I think we've had this very significant break to the upside here on the, on the ICE dollar index. Now, it should be said that we haven't cleared the euro USD's range floor at about 111.25. Uh, we have to keep a close eye on that to see if the euro is going to uh, acknowledge its own risks to the Brexit. But this is certainly a point in which the dollar can uh, gain traction from another fundamental theme other than its traditional uh, monetary policy forecast because interest rate expectations themselves, so we'll put it over here, interest rate expectations themselves are, have actually improved a little bit. All right? The probability of a November 2nd uh, FOMC rate hike has actually climbed uh, to approximately 26%. I think that's certainly stretched. Uh, expectations of that seem unreasonable given the proximity to the U.S. elections. And even if you're not political, you have to acknowledge that that's going to draw some degree of risk uh, to uh, uh, to drop on the market a rate hike. So I do think that that is incredibly unlikely, and that's going to struggle as a dollar driver. Uh, the same is true of the U.S. dollar's uh, traditional risk-on, risk-off appeal. Uh, we haven't really seen a whole lot of risk, whether we're talking about uh, FX-based volatility, this is the Euro Volatility Index, or the Equity-Based Volatility Index. They're generally very low and remain very low. So outside of risk 
uh, risk on, risk off for the safe haven theme of the U.S. dollar. And outside of the uh, interest rate forecast for the dollar, which is not going to be particularly robust, I think that it's going to fall to this uh, idea that the uh, capital flows around the world are redirecting to the U.S., whether for yield or for safety. All right, and in this case, it's actually a combination of both. So this was the morning's very remarkable move, uh, but we do have some very uh, important event risk still ahead. I don't think it's going to get to the scale that we saw here with the pound dollar, uh, but we do need to take stock of the upcoming non-farm payrolls report. The non-farm payrolls are going to have more of the uh, risk exposure, right? the more of the headline response knee-jerk reaction. We've seen in the past that uh, we can. Uh, there's an emphasis shift. Uh, either the market pays uh, dead attention to the non-farm payrolls themselves, and dictate that dictates their move, uh, or they pay more attention to the underlying statistics, like the unemployment rate, like the average hourly earnings, uh, which is the foundation for uh, inflation, uh, and using that as an interest rate uh, or rate expectations gauge. Looking between the uh, jobless rate and uh, earnings, which is inflation, those are essentially tapping into the dual mandates of the U.S. Central Bank. All right, but I do think that in this particular round, the focus is going to be back on those payrolls. The headline figure that is so readily snapped up and uh, uh, directing markets. Now, as I said, I think these rate expectations for a hike in November are overdone, and this uh, perhaps puts the, the dollar at some degree of risk. If the non-farm payrolls come out to be weak, uh, it will be a reflection of a weak U.S. economy. It will be also a reflection of a lower probability rate hike, and that will probably sink the U.S. dollar. Uh, it it uh, doesn't have a special contingency here uh, on this one. Now. If the U.S. dollar does respond uh, negatively, it does pull back. I have a preference. I have some preferences, actually. Uh, I think that the dollar-yen and its break of its descending trend channel, uh, a remarkable move above 102 and then making its way all the way up to 104, I think that that stands to be a significant pullback. And this is not just uh, on contingency of that data. It also happens to be the view of the markets that they are just generally more oriented towards congestion and range. It is very difficult to sustain a breakout trend like this when few other markets are actually providing that kind of motivation. So this, as a fade in the event of a negative U.S. Uh, employment report, uh, is a possibility. If you want to abide by more uh, so the ranges than something like the euro usd ranging back up into uh, that 1250 1275 level is also a viable situation there you don't you're not trying to uh, work against momentum on a breakout here you're just playing or catering to the range all right so this is another option of an uh, an anti dollar or weak dollar outcome you can also uh, obviously make a case for the pound dollar. However, given how much we were traced from that extreme low, it, it's going to be so, somewhat dubious to see how far the dollar would slide against this particular currency. Now, alternatively, if the dollar does well, all right, if we see interest rate expectations uh, rise, even though I would remain dubious, um, I would be still skeptical of the dollar yen. I would even be skeptical of the dollar yen if risk appetite trends started to rise in the wake of a positive U.S. employment figure. This is a wedge that definitely needs a break. But a break to the upside on risk on, risk off is not particularly appealing in my view because it's very difficult to sustain a steady inflow of capital to support and uh, extend such a already extended move. We know how uh, overdone this market is. This is the monthly chart of the ESPY. All right, this is definitely reaching into the stratosphere and it's out of oxygen. A break to the upside is possible, but follow through momentum are very improbable. So even in the event of a uh, strong 
US data and strong risk on reaction, I still am not particularly fond of the dollar yen. It's <laughs> it's tough for me to, to see a really encouraging, really robust backdrop for the dollar yen. It's possible um, if risk trends are neutral, if the dollar is particularly strong, but more importantly, if the Bank of Japan did something uh, so uh, controversial that uh, the markets believe they could uh, legitimately devalue the currency in a very meaningful way despite all their efforts to this point. That's a very unlikely uh, track, so I'm not uh, particularly keen on this currency pair. A strong dollar would also help extend my Aussie USD short. I already hit my first target this past session uh, for 90 pips. I trailed the stop to break even. We'll see if we can get down to the bottom of the range. If it uh, is attempting to break the bottom of the range, I would consider that a separate trade, and I would uh, treat it as such. Um, if you want a continuation, then something like the Kiwi dollar, that head and shoulders pattern has definitely breached. Uh, we have the uh, shoulder, head, shoulder, and the neckline. We broke the neckline. A continued dollar advance would definitely have a considerable range to work with here. You could also look at something like the dollar CAD, which is working itself once again into a wedge uh, within a broader range. Uh, if you have an, uh, a strong dollar outcome, perhaps a break of 133 would be uh, warranted. Of course, that's also going to fight the uh, prevailing winds for oil, which when we look at the inverse uh, for oil here, this is actually oil upright, uh, when you look at the inverse, we know that the correlation between these two is quite robust, yet it has been deviating significantly as of late. So there are some conflicting pressures in such a scenario. Now, of course, we can also look at other, I mean, we can look at the pairs like EURUSD has a range to work with. We could try to uh, fade or take advantage of the rapid movements on dollar yen, pound uh, dollar. Uh, there are many opportunities out there, uh, but we do need to keep grounded in the reality that these markets are, generally speaking, not particularly uh, solid in developing trend. Most of the markets have something similar in context to the S&P 500. They are generally range-bound, and they are uh, steeped in complacency. That makes for di very difficult trading. All right? And when you pit it against uh, tentative technical breakouts, uh, you have emotions uh, easily overriding a rational interpretation of what the market has to offer. So while there are opportunities out there, they are generally still of the nature for range, all right, and congestion. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to have perfect technical boundaries to it, but it is a difficult environment in which to feed a trend. All right, so some fireworks in the uh, previous session in the early morning friday session we will have more fireworks into friday or uh, friday's session through the close make sure you're keeping a close eye on these markets now i guess you should uh, you should ask yourself do i think the s&p 500 has the means to break through the end of the week and if so which direction is it likely to go all right Mull that, that consideration over and extend it to next week as well. Uh, think about what you uh, find in terms of market conditions for developing a breakout and a trend and what bearings and convictions you have for risk on or risk off. If you can, if you can uh, settle those questions for yourself, you'll be in a much better position to place trades, reasonable trades, uh, going forward. Okay, So we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next and final rundown for the market tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.